Good morning. There are some of you that are visiting with us today, and we're pleased to be able to welcome you here. There are some of you that are coming home because it's what we do at, at this time of year, and so welcome home. For the last few weeks, we've been engaged in a sermon series around the Nativity, and so each week we've added still another character and to try to devi- develop a theme around that character and, and seek to find applicable parts of that character for, for our own lives. And, and so we started out with the angel and the angels as messengers in that very first week. None of, none of this happens very well without someone who is telling the story and who's calling us as human beings to hear the message of God in our lives. So the first week had to to do with the angels or the messengers. And, and then we added Mary and we, we added Joseph, and, and they're pretty important to the big picture too, aren't they? And this week it's, it's about shepherds. Uh, and so as we continue to, to unfold this, uh, the story that we have here in, in Luke's gospel uh, that Shepherd Sam did a really good job of, uh, of telling us about, uh, this story is just this really important. But I, but I wonder if, if you were the one who was writing the story, if you were the one who was uh, kind of putting all of these elements in place, particularly this element about who gets to hear the good news first, um, who would you choose to be on the receiving end of this just really amazing announcement? I, I mean, would the person that you would choose to hear the angel's message, would it, would it be King Herod or someone else in Herod's court? Would you choose maybe Emperor Augustus's governor over the area. Maybe you would choose someone in religious life. Perhaps the person that you would choose to hear the message would uh, be the high priest over the temple. Maybe who you would choose to hear the message first would be someone from an upper economic class, someone who has political standing, someone who has social clout, so when they speak, their voice is heard. Or or maybe you would consider someone who actually makes a living as a herald. People who are paid to be messengers and to carry messengers from authority out among the people. There's been a great deal that has been written over time about first century shepherds. And the reality is... There's not much of it that's very good, okay? So anything that's been written about first century shepherds for all practical purposes is really very negative. One of the sources that we have regarding uh, shepherds is a writing in Judaism called the Mishnah. It's a Jewish uh, writing that is based on 700 years of oral law. 700 years from around 500 B.C. to around... 200 AD. And in that writing, it warns against six occupations that should never be entered into by God-fearing Jews, and top on that list was shepherds. Okay. Now, the rabbis, the ones who were the religious teachers of the day, urged people to uh, have no contact with anyone involved in one of five careers. And one of those careers was shepherding. All right. So, in fact, um, Willie Nel- those of you who are old enough to, to remember Willie Nelson's song, Mamas, don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys, right? You see, that's, that's new stuff, okay? The original version of that was, Mamas, don't let your babies grow up to be shepherds. Don't let your children grow up to be shepherds. So why in the world should shepherds be so ignored and so despised? I can offer you four interrelated reasons for that, and to be honest with you, it sounds a little bit like David Letterman kind of stuff. So let's go down, uh, let's go down these four. The first thing is shepherds seemingly had no 
boundaries. They didn't obey the boundary markers in the tending of their sheep, so they ended up trespassing on private property. Now, along with this, while they were trespassing on private property, they got in a reputation for having sticky fingers. That is, they would pick up anything that they saw that was loose that they wanted, and they'd take it for their own. So that's a problem with people who are shepherds. The second thing is there was a kind of honor among thieves. No shepherd, get this, no shepherd was allowed to give testimony in any kind of legal or court proceedings since they were all considered to be just a pack of liars anyway. Okay? Not good. The third thing is because of their constant work with animal waste and with dead animals, shepherds are always in a state of um, uncleanliness. They're, they're considered to be uh, unclean as far as religious law goes. And for that reason, shepherds were not generally allowed to go into the synagogues. Uh, they weren't allowed to go in the temple. Uh, and they would not be expected or welcomed in any worship places. Now, the fourth thing that I would offer to you, and as David Letterman would say, the number one reason that shepherds aren't liked is that there were rumors around that while shepherds watched their flock by night, the shepherds were engaged in inappropriate behavior with the sheep. Okay, so enough about that and we'll keep going. Now, when the adult Jesus comes on the scene, do you remember one of the stories or one of the things that he compares himself to? Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I am a good shepherd. Can you imagine how the people would have reacted? They would have sucked air when Jesus said that. <gasps> a good shepherd? There is no such thing as a good shepherd. Shepherds had become so marginalized that they were outcast of the society. And no good religious person would work with them, would eat with them, would worship with them, or would allow them into the court or into the synagogue. And so the very fact that this announcement, this marvelous announcement is made to shepherds is really astonishing. Of all of the people in the world to whom the message about the birth of God, God's Son in the flesh could be given to, it is shepherds that are told that the Savior of the world is being given to them. And while this is unexpected, yes, this is completely unexpected unless, unless you know Luke. And if you know Luke and how Luke writes, and I would encourage you, maybe that this would be a goal for you early in the new year, it would be to read Luke's gospel through. Because there's a couple of things that come out in Luke's gospel. One is there's a constant reminder that Jesus came for the lost and for the last and for the least of society. Over and again, the stories that are told have to do with the lost and the least and the last. Uh, another part of that is when you read Luke's gospel, unlike the others, Luke uses one particular word 11 times over the course of his writing. That's about once every other chapter, Luke uses the word poor. Luke's gospel has a special um, relationship with the poor of this world. So, um, whenever we um, approach uh, Advent and when we approach Christmas and, and we start looking at pictures of the nativity or we, we start setting our nativity scenes up, one of the things that we end up doing is we end up dressing the shepherds and making them look like really cute additions uh, for our Christmas pageants. I mean, the shep we, we look forward to the shepherds. They're the cute kids, okay? They're the ones that come in wearing the bathrobes and carrying some kind of walking cane. But the reality is, I mean, the reality is that undermines 
who shepherds really were in this picture. Uh, the artist who usually depict it, depict the, the shepherds standing back until the, until the wise men come in two weeks. Uh, the shepherds are always the ones that are on the furthest edges uh, of the scene. They're almost always the ones with their head bowed. Maybe they're supposed to be looking at uh, the baby Jesus or, or maybe it, we, we think that that's a, a posture of humility. Um, and I'm not sure that we got any of that right where the shepherds are concerned. Uh, frankly, I, I think probably the better image of, uh, of the shepherds is really the herdman kids, okay? You're, you're, really, I mean, you remember the herdmans from the greatest little Christmas pageant ever. I, I think that's probably the better image of, uh, of the shepherds. And if, and if not the herdman kids, then maybe the other image that we need to think about is that who the shepherds are more likely to be in contemporary culture may be a group of homeless men. Uh, or maybe a group of migrant men who go out and who stand on the corner day after day waiting for someone to come by and pick them up and take them to work in the fields or take them to work in lawn care on some wealthy person's yard or, or just pick them up for a couple of hours. And, and before you start to dismiss that image, I, I'm wondering, is it a coincidence? Is it a coincidence then that in one of Jesus' stories, he talks about those who are standing around in the marketplace waiting to be hired for the day. They don't have any kind of regular job. They're on the margins of the society. They are the poor. And they're just waiting for someone to come. And Jesus talks about the, the vineyard owner, the field owner who comes at different times of the day and takes the ones that he needs, puts them to work in the field, and in the end, they all get paid the very same amount. So... When you, when you look at this picture and you, you think about a group like this being chosen to be the first to hear this amazing message, you've got to ask, did the angels make a wrong turn, okay? Did, did the angel get the message wrong about who he was supposed to go and speak to? Had they intended the announcement for the king of peace to coming into this world to really be given to the movers and and the shakers, and the really important people of this world? You know the answer, don't you? You, you? you know the answer. The angels got it right. They got it right because they knew exactly what they were doing because this new king that was being born was the one who was bringing peace to all and especially to the poor of this world. And while the birth of Jesus was unnoticed by so many. By so many, it gets noticed by the shepherds. That group of people you don't want your boys to grow up and be like. That group that you don't want your son to run around with or to become involved with one day. So appearing to the shepherds, God showed His willingness to speak to anyone. That God can speak to anyone at any time. One of the memories that I'm... Uh, it's, it's kind of in my rhythm, I, I think, that, that I keep coming back to at this time of year is that when I was in seminary and I started seminary, it's hard to believe, 30 years ago um, this, this past fall, uh, I was I was really country go to town. I, I'd grown up here in Appalachia. I'd grown up in East Tennessee. Had gone to college in East Tennessee. Uh, I, I knew uh, I, I saw very few homeless people in my life, and the ones that I did see, you either uh, assumed really the worst about them, or you assumed that somehow they got taken care of. But when I went to seminary, one of the things that my seminary did is it made the assumption that some of us needed to get out more, okay? And the way they had of getting us out more was uh, we would uh, we'd go work in the soup kitchens in downtown Atlanta. And we would go, uh, we'd go work in the night shelters in downtown Atlanta. Atlanta. So my very, uh, my very first year in seminary, Thanksgiving and Christmas took on completely different meanings for me. 
um, because uh, the, only, the only character from 30 years ago I can remember was a guy that the rest of the men called Wolf. Uh, good, uh, good size uh, African American guy, and I remember his, his gray beard, and uh, him always wearing a, a ball cap. Um, but one of the memories in all of that was working in the night shelter one night, and you, you take turns sitting up, so someone's always awake. And and during my turn of, of sitting up, I watched how some of the men would would awaken during the night, not necessarily go to the bathroom, but they'd awaken during the night and they'd sit on the edge of the cot and they'd start having this conversation with someone who wasn't there. And I always wondered, you know, is this mental illness? What's, what's really going on here? And it was about that time, for those of you who are old enough, it, it, you may remember a movie, or you remember when Dudley Moore uh, was, was Arthur, okay? Uh, and in and, and, and Arthur, uh, he's this rich, spoiled guy. And that's in the first one. In the second one, uh, he's on the streets. And by that time, the person who had always taken care of him was his butler, and his butler was dead. And, and Arthur finds himself in, uh, in the night shelter, and he's sleeping on a cot there. And, and you see him wake up in the near of the night, and as far as everybody else knows, he's just having a conversation with himself. And I came to wonder during that time of year as those men were having conversations, were they having conversations with ghosts? Were they having conversations with people out of their past? Or, or in some way, were they having a conversation with God? And in that place of, of who they were and what there was going on in their life, was God in some way speaking to them in a way that only they could hear and only they could discern? In, in your life and, and in my life, how does, how does God get through to us? How does God speak to us in a way that we can hear and we can process that and, and we can respond to it? Um, um, Shepherd Sam, I mean, he's honest. He said, yeah, we were scared, okay? I mean, who wouldn't be scared? It's not like they had been sitting around the campfire that night singing Kumbaya and having a Bible study, okay? It's not like they were sitting there repeating the scriptures of the Old Testament about the Messiah and just praying, God, what's your will for my, my life? It's not like they were involved in some kind of small group study and as they were in conversation with one another, their conversation was about what's God want to do in my life and in that context this happens. No, these guys are exhausted. Some of them are asleep. Some of them are awake keeping watch by night, and all of a sudden, things start to happen. You daggone right, it's scary. When God breaks in, it can often be a scary thing. But true to what happens in the Gospels particularly, it happened when the mess, anytime the messenger appeared, to the Mary and Joseph and the shepherds, it's clear that the recipients of the message are terrified or they are afraid. But there is a word of assurance that is given each time the message is spoken, and the word of assurance is, be not afraid. Don't be afraid. And, and then when Jesus grows up, and he starts to be engaged in ministry. He knows that there are things about life with him that gets to be kind of scary. And in the Gospels, there are times when Jesus says, Fear not. And so for the shepherds, when they get this message, it all begins with being terrified. It begins with being afraid, but it quickly begins to move, just like it did with Joseph, just like it began, uh, did with Mary, of moving to that place where they can faithfully respond to what God's doing. So during this Advent season, only a couple more days left in Advent, and you know what? God can really do some amazing things in our lives if we but allow God the space to work in. Christmas Day is coming. Christmas is coming and God can still do some amazing things of speaking into your heart and into my mind and heart in a way that we can hear that. So as, as we approach this unfolding nativity,
And we see folk up here who are getting to be really familiar to us. I wonder, I just wonder, who would you have had up here to unfold this story? Who would you have had up here to be the recipient of this message from the angels? Do we have the right one? Do we have someone from the margins of society up here speaking to Mary and Joseph who are also on the margins of their society at this point in time? The poor literally speaking to the poor. But maybe Maybe this story is more familiar than what we think it is. And maybe we understand that the writer got it right, that God and the angels got it right that night. Because the shepherds, they reach that place that they move from being afraid and terrified to rejoicing. And the story is familiar because we find ourselves being drawn into it every time we hear it. And some of us, we've been hearing it for 60 or 70 years now. And there's just something about it that just draws us in every year when we hear the story. And I'll tell you the reason why it draws us in. It draws us in every year because we know who we are. We know that we're not perfect. We know that we're not holy even though Jesus came and died and gave his life to make us holy. We know that there are places in our lives that we continue to keep hidden from the Lord and from the Spirit and from others. But the Lord knows that. And so maybe the, the shepherds are not so foreign to us. And it's like Sam, Shepherd Sam, says here at the end, no one had ever chosen me for anything. That almost makes me cry every time I think about it. No one had ever chosen me for anything. But that's not true, friends. It's really not true. Because you too have been chosen just as I have. We have been chosen to bear the good news. We have been chosen to go closer, to go to Bethlehem and see, and to make known the wonders of what has happened, but not just in Bethlehem, but outside these doors and away from this campus. And whether you live in Kingsport or the surrounding area, whether you live off far from here, and you're going to be going back that way soon, know that God's chosen you too. He's chosen you to be a part of this Christmas plan and this Christmas message. And so when you go from here, may you go forth from here glorifying and praising God for what God has done in your life. And that's the attitude and that's the means by which we come to this table every time that the table is set before us. We come here over and again because that's what Jesus came. This manger, this table becomes for us a manger. A place that holds the body and the blood of Christ. That holds God with us. Here in this place, we lift up the bread that becomes His body for us. We lift up the cup that becomes for us the cup of salvation and we hold out our hands to receive God with us and our hands become the manger that holds Him and we receive Him and we go out into this world to tell others what God has done not just for us but for them too. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I, I just thank you for your word. And that even though the story has been on the printed page and has been told for centuries now, we find ourselves reconnecting to it every year. Forgive us, O oh God, that in this season we become so busy that we are slow to turn toward the manger and to see ourselves there among the others as those who have heard the good news and who can't help but being drawn to your presence. 
Forgive us for those things that we know that we ought not to have done, but have done. Forgive us for the words that we know that we ought not to have said, but they rolled too freely from our lips. Forgive us, O oh God, for those places where we have missed the needs of our neighbor so near to us. And even as we ask for forgiveness, we hear the good news that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love toward us. And that in Jesus' name, we are forgiven. Amen.